Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am here with Molly Lakin. We are going to talk about songwriting and the career of songwriting. Um, and she is from Songwriting Consultants Limited. And I would love, well, she's got a book that she's going to tell you about that she wrote. But before we get there, I want to get into her backstory because it looks super interesting from what I read in her bio. Um, so Molly, I'd love to have you tell everybody kind of how you came into starting your songwriting career. I know you you moved from Canada to the U.S. and it sounds like a harrowing story and how you got yourself into this business of songwriting. My day job was being a social worker for Los Angeles County Department of Public Social Services. Mm, Doesn't that, sound, not, that sound like a perfect that job? That does not sound like an easy job. My job was to go after the deadbeat dads oh. who were the alleged fathers of my clients' children. Awful. And all of the fathers were allegedly Ringo Starr, John Lennon, Elvis, and you name it. Oh my goodness. So I, little me from Canada with a white cotton bra, I had to go into the business offices of those rock stars. And since I was, I knew they were in the music business, I used to carry my baritone ukulele with me in case they needed samples of my work. And I had a magnificent 12 song cycle about big Newtons. And I, I just couldn't understand why Joni Mitchell and Carol King weren't slurping them up. <laughs> to this day, I don't get it. But that's another story. So, of course, these CPAs threw me out of their offices. And they happened to be on Hollywood Boulevard, right at the corner where there was a writer's meeting every Friday at 3 o'clock at Warner Brothers Publishing. And the, the meeting was open to anybody. So I just went and every week there was a great big blackboard listing the artists and what they needed song-wise. And every week I wrote a song. It wasn't a very good song, but I was trying. And the publisher running the meeting was a guy named Artie Wayne, who moved over to A&M. And I told him, looking him straight in the face, you know, Artie, I turned down two other staff writing gigs to work with you. The heavens opened and he said, well, come sign with me. Nobody had offered me a deal. Of course. And wow, you got serious. God boxing. forgave me. God forgave me. And I, I was on the staff of Elmo Music, which is the A&M ASCAP branch. And I worked with every songwriter they had on staff. They were fabulous people. They taught me what a hook was. They taught me how to tell a story. And I became a songwriter. And I started getting all kinds of cuts. And they paid me every week. And this was a royalty as against future earnings. And my God, I had the dream job. Well, okay, first of all, how did you have the guts? Because you clearly, you needed to work on your songwriting at that point. Like you were, you were writing, but you, like you said, you didn't know what a hook was and all that stuff. How did you have the guts to like ask for that job? Honestly, Brie, I had no fallback position. <laughs> the whole staff at the Los Angeles County Social Services Office was desperate to get rid of me. 
I felt, I mean, I was sitting there at my desk with the phone off the hook. What did I know how to help anybody? And computer system was ridiculous. Um, I put in a request for a check in March and it showed up in December. So I couldn't help these people. I was writing checks from my own account to help everybody with emergency groceries. Wow. So I wanted to be a songwriter. There was no place I could go back to if I failed. So I had to do this. I just had to do this. I was a maniac. It was full time, all time, 24 8, and that's not a typo. <laughs> I had to do this. That's amazing. And did, did you want to be an artist or you only wanted to write? Well, I thought I sang great, <laughs> but apparently, when I was a staff writer, they paid me extra not to sing. <laughs> I would I would urge you to ask Chuck K, but he's dead. <laughs> wow, that's funny. That's funny. So you learned from working with all of these people on their payroll. And were you every cut that you were writing, were you collaborating or did you start writing stuff on your own too? I was co co-writing. At the time they thought my lyrics were fabulous and my melodies, not so much. And so uh, for years, I was a lyricist collaborating not only with the Almo writers, but with all kinds of amazing composers who were writing movie scores and TV scores. And I had extraordinary, gorgeous melodies to lyricize. Mm. And that got me going. And, and I had a mentor whose name was Mac David. And he told me that when he didn't have someone to write with he wrote his own melodies so i switched from the baritone ukulele to the keyboard and ah there's all the notes <laughs> aha and you can hear c and hear c and here's e you got to keep it within that octave and three and so i started writing my own melodies and hey if i do say so myself I defy you to, to not sing them. So did you have any training before this? Like, had you gone to any music school or had you taken any classes in songwriting? When I was a kid, like all the little girls on Island Park Drive in Canada, I took piano lessons. And when I started playing pop music on my mother's piano, she locked it. <laughs> oh, no. There's a music lover. Anyway, then I went to the University of Toronto to study literature. And everybody those days, during those days, was playing guitars. Well, my fingers are too short to fit around 12, uh, six strings. So someone taught me to play the baritone ukulele, which only has four. And I was addicted to this process of writing and singing. And my roommate quit school and became a dental hygienist. All the other girls on the floor at Cody House and Whitney Hall, they, uh, a lot of them changed universities. So I don't want you to think the music I was making was joyously accepted <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> So I did have some training, but most of what I write, honestly, is from my gut. I hear it in my head. I hear the melody and the rhythm in my head, and then I go to the keyboard to find it. Mm. And do you think your your study of literature helped you with your... My husband's a literature professor, so I'm asking, do you think that, oh, really? that helped you with your lyrics? Well, I had things to say, but at first... They told me I sounded like an English teacher. <laughs> like, to whom should I send my heart? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So I had to loosen up. And when I was at Elmo, Artie Wayne used to say, take your bra off, Molly. <laughs> In other words, loosen up, get down. Can you imagine a guy telling you that? No, absolutely anyway, not. <laughs> it's true. 
if I'm lying, I'm dying and I'm not dead. No, I believe it. I believe that it, you would never say that now, but I totally believe that that was the, the culture and it wasn't, I, I wouldn't be offended by that. I get what he's saying. Well, it's important to write the way you talk. Sing mm -hmm. it like you say it. If he wouldn't say it, don't sing it. That's right. And don't, whatever you do, make it rhyme just to rhyme. Say what you mean first. I like to write the first draft of my lyrics just as a garbage draft. And then I circle the lines I want to use in the song. And I don't care if they rhyme or not. Once the, the story is all set out, then I choose the lines I want to, I want to include in the lyric. And some of them rhyme here and there. But rhyming is not it. it uh, lyric isn't just a series of rhymes. It's feelings. Mm -hmm. Feelings. And on a scale of one to ten, most of us live somewhere around five or six. Everything's fine. But when we listen to music, when we read books, go to the movies, play video games, we want a peak experience. So the worst thing that ever happened or the best thing that ever happened. So on a scale of one to 10, that's plus or minus 15. So write a song, the best thing that ever happened or the worst thing that ever happened, but don't write in the middle. We live in the middle. As songwriters, we're travel agents and take people mm -hmm. on adventures, emotional adventures. I love that perspective. Yeah, you're not going to write a song about, you know, your morning routine where you brushed your teeth and then you ate breakfast. You know, nobody cares about that. However, we could certainly write a song about brush my teeth, did it again, swishy, 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 gotta have the mouthwash, gotta have the I mean, I could do it just for a joke. And right. I bet that one, that's the one that wins the Grammy. <laughs> so what are some uh, of the songs that we would know you said you've written a lot for movies especially when you were at a and m what what are some songs that we would know that you were collaborating on well the first song i wrote co-wrote was with steve dorf and we wrote a gorgeous song together called you set my dreams to music it's been recorded almost a hundred times and hasn't been a single yet I don't know why, but it's out there and it's beautiful. To this day, it's beautiful. What artists have recorded? I haven't heard of that song. Well, Anne Murray, Dusty Springfield, John oh, okay. Travolta. It's everywhere. Oh, I'll have to go look for that. Listen to it. Yeah, I'm a you'll big Anne Murray fan, so I'll have to look up her version. Well, it, I forget what album it's on, but she did it. Mm. And I didn't think I'd live. I was so excited. <laughs> Here she was a major artist. And I know she didn't cut it just because I was Canadian. I was going to say, and she's Canadian. Yeah. That's cool. She's like, she's like God in Canada. Oh, yeah. Even I now, believe it. Even now. I believe it. Um, and then, so you've written a bunch of songs th uh, for films? Yes. Uh, I was writing with a composer who did a lot of movies and TV songs. And one was the theme from a TV movie miniseries called East of Eden. And the theme was gorgeous. And Milt Oaken, who was a major producer and discovered Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Bob Dylan, and you name it, heard the melody and asked me to write a lyric to it. So I did. It was a beautiful lyric. And then uh, Placido Domingo was a big deal in those days. He was, he was on an album with John Denver called Perhaps Love. And Milt initially wanted to include it on the album. And here's the, a true story of how it made it to the album. In those days, there were Betamaxes and VHS. I was one of three people in the world who had Betamax. <laughs> the others included Placido Domingo and Milt Oaken. And he asked Milt, actually, Emmis, 
he asked me to please record an episode of Dallas that Friday night because Placido wasn't going to be home and his VCR timer was broken. So I recorded it and I had my Betamax tape and Mort says, or Milt says, okay, just drop it off at my house. And I said, well, I will as soon as you include my song on the CD. And he did. I mean, it was like I was blackmailing the guy. Oh, my gosh. All for an episode of Dallas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you imagine this tenor, the number one tenor in the world, lives and breathes by Dallas, but don't we all? <laughs> or didn't we all? So you use what you got. You are definitely very resourceful. I am resourceful. I don't have, it's nice to have ammunition. It would be nice if they just took your song because you had nice red hair and you were talented. But there's a lot that goes into getting a record and getting a, a placement in a movie or TV show these days. Yeah, that is You don't just send somebody an MP3. You got to do the dance. That's true. Absolutely. Now, you said one of your songs actually um, won an Oscar. Is that right? No, a little bit right. Okay. There was a movie called Violet, and I wrote the song score with Charlie Black and Rory Burke, who were two of Nashville's top of the top of the top songwriters. And the movie won an Oscar. The movie won an Oscar. Okay. Um, what year was that? I'm not sure I know that movie. I don't remember, hmm. but it was a while back. Nonetheless, I have it on my wall. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So how long did you stay with um, A&M, the Elmo music? Altogether, I was a staff writer for 10 years. From hmm. Elmo, I went to Interworld, and then I went to Chapel. And those were great days hmm. because... When I heard a song that one of the chapel writers wrote, I would ask my publisher, could you please set up a co-writing time with Jimmy or Johnny or Susie? By the way, there weren't any other girl writers in chapel at the time. Mm. So it was always a guy. And in, in Nashville, when you write with somebody, you show up at 10 o'clock, you have coffee till 10.30, and then you start to write. And at exactly noon, you leave the song, go have lunch with all the other great writers in town and tell them what you're working on. Then you go back to the office at chapel and finish the song. It's boom, boom, boom. Wow. There's no futzing around. It's business. And the songs are phenomenal. I think the best songs ever written in the whole world our country song. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, oh, mama, I'm dying, my dog died. I'm having beer for breakfast and the train just went through the doghouse. <laughs> None of that. You know what country music is like now. It's all rhythm. It's all sing-alongable choruses. And the lyrics are absolutely brilliant. They are. And, and, it, and a lot of it is, has a lot of infusion of pop, too. It's all pop, it's all rhythm. In fact, rhythm that started with hip hop as now it's in every, on every billboard chart. Mm. Christian, Rastafarian, pop, rock and roll. It's all rhythmic, rhythmic. There's no more. Oh my God, I'm staying here. <laughs> I am sad. Oh, oh, oh dear. It's And when I write a song, I always write the rhythm first now. Ah, okay. So you've changed your process a little bit. I have. Well, you have to you change the process and you change the result. And yep. music has changed so much. Oh, yeah. So if you compare why... what was popular in the 70s, you know, I've been like, I love 70s on 7 on Sirius XM. And I've been listening to like the top thousand 70s songs, you know, 
and I'm like this this music would never be popular now it's so I don't know a little bit sad those 70s yeah (laughs) you know well that's why I wrote my book insider secrets to hit songwriting in the digital age because everything is completely different now Mm -hmm. there are so many new income streams the traditional ones aren't paying like they used to but the best way to make a big chunk of cash these days is to know the music supervisors who are choosing the music for the movies and TV shows and commercials and indies and have a the song on TV. One performance is $7,000. Mm. Beats working. And a number one song makes $2,400,000. Big time. And if you have a song that's a theme for a sitcom, runs five years, $460,000. I'm not guaranteeing that your songs are going to earn that much, but I have seen the checks. Yep. And and what, what percentage of writers that have the talent to do that can actually get those kinds of deals? It's not a percentage. That's in, that's a, a, a something we don't do in the music business, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the guy who makes one more phone call gets the gig. And by the way, everything starts with the song. I love Pro Tools. I My producers use Pro Tools. But you don't write your song on Pro Tools. Mm-hmm. You write your song with your left hand behind your back and you sit at your keyboard and you choose the individual notes with rhythm first. And you record it, you listen back, you tweak it, you re-record it, you go on and on and on till it clicks and says, aha, it's ready. And then when the song's written, absolutely haul out the Pro Tools and go after it, make a record. But there's a huge difference between writing a song and making a record. Yeah, I I agree. But, you know, I always hear about, you know, these artists, especially back in the day when people had a lot more studio time and, you know, artists had more development time. They would spend months in the studio writing. And I always thought, why are they doing that in the studio? Bands do that. And record companies used to underwrite that. They don't anymore. Mm -hmm. And these days, the songwriter has to create a master. You can't make a demo with just a piano and a voice anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got to present a master. I don't know how to do that. I hire good people who know how to do that. I hire great singers and all the best musicians, and we get it done. So if you're going to compete in a very competitive marketplace, give them what they want. Yep. Nobody re-records anything anymore. That's you true. create it, you make the MP3, and they just sink it into their project. That's very true. Now, how do you know when your song is at that point where it's time to record? And how do you help other, because I know you consult for helping other artists. How, how do you help them know that like this song is is ready? Well, for my my own writing, it just I'm lucky it just clicks in my tummy and says, Molly, it's ready. <laughs> but when I'm reviewing somebody else's material, first I'm very gentle with them because it's hard to send your work to a stranger. Mm-hmm. And I review everything in terms of the marketplace. So where would this, which chart would this fit on? And Okay, so let's say it's a country song. So um, does do we sing it like we say it? And if not, let's make it so it does sound conversational. Would I say this if I were talking to a friend on the phone? If not, how would I say it? Have I heard this before? If so, could I make it a little different? And if not, could I write something else? And that goes to the melody and the words. So if you're a lyricist, I love working with lyricists because they're usually very articulate and most mostly 
I help them with the rhythm of their words, and then I help them find a quote unquote composer or preferably somebody who is a singer songwriter who's going to record the finished song. Got it. And I know everybody and everybody knows me. <laughs> she said modestly, but it's <laughs> true. I'm tough. So when someone gets a call from me and says, Hey, I have a great artist for you. They pay attention. Mm. There's one time back in the day, I had a deal with Warner Brothers Music for one song I wrote called Silver Wings and Golden Wings, and it was for one year. And if after the first year, they didn't want it anymore, I got it back. And if they did, they had to pay me $150. Well, that amount of money was a windfall for me in those days. And I spoke to the president of Warner Brothers Music, whose name I'm not going to mention. But he says, Molly, I'm not going to throw good money after bad. Okay. So I got the song back and went somewhere else, rewrote it. And it was a big, big hit uh, on the country charts. And at the ASCAP dinner, where the awards were given out, that guy was sitting right next to me. <laughs> and he did say, very graciously, Molly, I should never have given you back your son. Mm. So nobody knows anything. But the thing is, you got to believe in yourself. These people have power, but they don't know everything. And things change. So if you believe in your songs, treasure them like your children. Nothing's too good for your kids. Nothing's too good for your songs. Yeah. It's a hard line to walk, I think, though, because some people get so precious about their song that they can't take any criticism or, you know, think about how they could change it. They're like, this is what came out of me. Like, oh, it can't be changed. You know what I mean? This is what came to me from God. Right. Is another favorite. Yes. And I said, well, God also sent you to me. <laughs> so honestly, if you can't take criticism, Play your songs for your mother and go to medical school mm -hmm. because all we get, I Bree, I know you know this. In a day, you might get 50 no's and one little yes. All you need is the one yes. That's right. Well, tell them about your book because I'm really curious about it. Is it more about how they can make income streams for songs or is it beyond that? And, and who, what kind of people did you interview for it? Well, my book includes interviews with 10 of the best A-listers in the business. And they include Tim Whipperman, the publisher's publisher in Nashville. He gave me a wonderful interview and how he treats his writers and what he expects from them. And the truth is he lets them write and he lets them do what they feel they need to do rather than dictate, you must do this, you must do that. And he's been very successful. I also interviewed Jim Andron, who has written 15,000 jingles. Ooh. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> and he figured it out. He hooked up with so-and-so who sold the time and he wrote, the, Jim wrote the jingles and it was it was happy time for a, for a long, long time. I also interviewed Debbie Huck, who was a Kentucky housewife who was very unhappy, and she wrote some songs at home. She thought they'd be good for Johnny Cash, and she actually picked up the phone and called his office. Can you imagine? And they said, oh, ma'am, come on down. Come on. We, we love to hear your song. And they listened to her five song. And I think it was a real, the real tape. And the guy said, well, these two we want. And these three are very pop. So go down the road and see the folks at Columbine. And on her first day in Nashville, she had five placements. This never happens. Okay, so she comes to Nashville. She writes with everybody. Meanwhile, she had a full-time job 
as a night watchman at the Seagram's plant. Oh. And she carried, oh, if I'm lying, I'm dying. She carried a cassette recorder and sang everything into the cassette recorder as she's walking up and down, guarding Seagram's. And she co-wrote a song with a guy named Bob Morrison, who's the king, the king of songwriters in Nashville. And the song sat in a pile for one of the pups, the one of the most famous female singers, sat there for a year. And his and the producer for the girl singer was the same as the producer for this guy. So the producer was playing the song when this guy walks in and he says, wait a minute, don't give it to her. I want that song. Well, the guy was Kenny Rogers. Mm. Number one, won a Grammy first record. Is this through the years? Is that the song? The song was You Decorated. Oh, You my Decorated Life. My Life. That's right. Okay. I'm not saying that because I am like a sucker for listening to the old top 40 shows. And I actually heard part of the story when they were introducing that song. And I was like, oh, this sounds so familiar. You Decorated My Life. That's right. That's so and cool. She, yeah. She wrote it about her kids. Aww. She had lots of children. And uh, she said it. I mean, you know, I found Debbie on Facebook. I know you they say nasty things about Facebook, but just about everybody I interviewed in my book is on Facebook. Either that or somebody I met at a music party, like Robin Erdang, who is a three-time Emmy winning music supervisor. Mm. I met her at a party and asked her for an interview and she was more than gracious. And she wins for Music supervision right now on Mrs. Maisel. Most people, though, I contacted through Facebook, and I, I, I have to laugh when people say, "Oh, it's it's a waste of time." I don't know. It's well, not. it is a great place to find people for sure. It's a great to find people and connect with them, and it's usually flattering when you're asked to give an interview. But some people say, "Oh, it's a waste of time." Who are you anyway? <laughs> Well, what, what motivated you to write the book? There was a gap in the marketplace. Nobody was writing about the digital age. Mm -hmm. And it's so completely different from all the other times in the music business since the caveman gonged his first gong. And so we need to know, you know, because you're a businesswoman, you, need, you know you need to adapt you want to be in the business, learn how it's done now. And I love this book. In fact, if I hadn't written it, I'd be in the in line in the rain to buy it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so what, like if I'm a, I'm an indie artist, I'm, I'm trying to get my music out there and get maybe sync placements and that kind of thing. What, what type of things will I learn by reading the book? You'll learn, first of all, you have to have great songs. No matter how fabulous your voice is and how well produced the tracks, if you don't have the songs, you've got nothing, baby. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell my clients, too. And people say, well, I don't understand. I spent this and this on these tracks and, blah, blah. and I take singing lessons. I have my teeth done. I had my nose done. I have a whole new wardrobe. I said, you, you started at the wrong end of this. You need to have wonderful songs. And I help them take their songs that are good and make them great. Mm. Without great songs, you don't have anything. But I can make sure that you do. And I'm very gentle with people because I know how fragile we are. I wouldn't say, honest to God, when I read this lyric, I just... It was the worst thing I ever heard. I would never say that. I would say, uh, down here in line three, this is a great line. Why don't we move that up? Say that twice. Take this part out. Make this section the chorus. Change the rhythm from the verse to the chorus, and let's see what we got. Mm. 
And if you can come with a clear head and want to do what's best for your songs, then I can really help you. I've mentored two generations of Grammy winners, and I have, does, uh, uh, well, I think it's over 7,000 clients who place their work in movies and TV shows and movies, uh, movies, TV shows, commercials, and all the new age stuff. Wow, that's that's a pretty amazing track record. So how, how do artists work with you? They contact me at songmd.com, which is the friendliest place on the web. And we set up a consultation. They send me their work, something that's unfinished or something that is finished and they don't know why it isn't working. And I give them an honest, gentle review. And then we decide whether we're gonna revise these songs or write some new ones based on the comments that I've made on their current. Got it. And if they pay attention, if they can, now I know how hard it is for someone to say, take that out. I wrote a novel a, a long time ago. People were giving me this feedback and I just came home and cried for days. <laughs> so if you can be tough and work with the brilliance that you have and make sure your whole song is unusual. Have I heard this before? If so, can I make it a little different? If not, could I write something else? Would I say this if I were talking to a friend on the phone? If not, how would I say it? And the same with the melody. Do we have a strong rhythm going here? I don't know any ballads that are out there breaking the land speed record to the charts. Hmm. So right this minute, put your ballads aside until the times change. Give them rhythm. And how does it work with the intellectual property? Because you're you're helping them revise. You know, there's like a fine line between being a collaborator and, and cons consulting with them. Well, that's a good question. I am a consultant. I charge a consulting fee and I don't take a percentage of the song. You need it so that all <laughs> the other people out there can rob you blind. But I don't want to, I don't want to take any part of it because um, you know how deals are made. The guy who's going to get the most percentage of what you do is the guy who's going to sign you. Mm -hmm. I say guy, I mean person. Yes. Makes sense. Okay. Well, so they go to, I love um, SongMD, right? Is that the website? SongMD.com. I love that. I love that, that dot com. And how do they find your book? It's at SimonAndSchuster.com. It's at Amazon.com. It's at SongMD.com. Goodreads, it's all over the web. Got Insider it. Secrets to Hit Songwriting in the Digital Age or Insider Secrets to Hit, Hit, Hit Songwriting in the Digital, Digital, Digital Age. I should have written a jingle for it. Yeah, you should have. You should have. I love that you have it. If, if people are watching on YouTube, it, you've got your book in the background, which is really smart. Well, thank you. Oh my gosh. This has been so great, Molly. I have loved getting to know you. You are definitely one of a kind and you know your stuff when it comes to songwriting. So I recommend that anybody listening or watching, if you need some help with your songwriting, reach out to SongMD, get the book, all the things I can tell that, you know, Molly really cares about your success. Thank you. I care about good writing. And when my clients are nominated for Grammys, I just, I mean, they're my, they're my kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm so proud of them. And I'm so proud of everybody who wakes up in the morning and finds a pencil and write something down. Anybody who tries, mm. keep, go, keep at it because you never know. And 
all kinds of miracles happen and all kinds of things happen by synchronicity and you never know, but you're not gonna meet anybody sitting in front of your laptop. You gotta go out there and be with the folks and network, 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 because people love to do business with people they know. That's how it is in corporate America. You can't be a stranger to a person after playing 18 holes of golf. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing in the music business. People like to do business with people they know. Yes. So think of the music bus business as a business and also one where the best of the best songs thrive. And you can write them. Yes. Really, really good advice. I love that. I love that for closing out the show. Thank you so much, Molly, for offering all of your knowledge, experience, and expertise to our audience. Thank you, Bree. I've enjoyed being your guest. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.